November 1945. Thousands of troops returned to the United States from World War II assignments. President Harry Truman and British Prime Minister Clement Attlee meet in Washington to discuss post-war problems. Across the country, 272,500 workers are idle as a result of a number of labor disputes. This threatens to curtail the supply of scarce consumer goods like radios, refrigerators, and washing machines. In Ithaca, New York, Democrats rejoice as James Conley is elected mayor. Rothschild's department store promises its customers that they will distribute scarce nylon hosiery on a fair priority basis as soon as possible. Cornell University announces that the enrollment for the fall 1945 semester has reached 6,500 students. Hundreds of World War II veterans are the victims of the most acute housing shortage in the university, and to alleviate the crisis, 50 surplus war houses will be transported from Messina to Ithaca, New York. On November 12, in convocation ceremonies at Bailey Hall, the New York State School of Industrial and Labor Relations is dedicated to the common interest of the employer and the employee. The first class of 107 students hears Governor Thomas E. Dewey call for the abolition of the old rules of force and violence, and he advocates negotiations based upon a knowledge and understanding of the economic process. Irving Ives is the first dean of the school. And Irv, uh, as the majority leader in the assembly, was really the key figure in the establishment of the school because he was chairman of the Joint Legislative Committee on Industrial and Labor Conditions. And it was that committee that proposed the establishment of a state school of industrial and labor relations. He was essentially pragmatic, and uh, he wanted labor and management to know more, and he also wanted to resolve industrial conflict. And that I might say that the work of the Ives Committee went on during World War II when I was serving overseas. And when I came back, I came back in November of 45 from overseas from Italy, and um, I was immediately called by Ives and by Bill Grote and said, this new school of industrial and labor relations uh, is going to be dedicated and he said, we want you and Hinda to come up for the dedication. And uh, we did. Then in the fall of 1945, when they were looking for a faculty for the school, uh, I had a, uh, a letter, I guess it was from Phillips Bradley, I don't remember exactly, asking if I was interested. He had put my name in. Morris Newfeld and I, arrived on the same day in January 1946, um, and uh, we've been friends ever since. Uh, I was on leave from Sarah Lawrence and only planned to go to Cornell for one semester, but I changed my mind. Dr. Day, who had um, been on the um, um, temporary board of trustees that drew up the plans for the new School of Industrial and Labor Relations, talked to me and said that he and Irv Ives, who was the first dean of the school, that both of them would want me to come here to teach. In January of 1946, I was a member of the faculty at New York University and also a member of the National uh, War Labor Board Region 2, I received a letter from President Day of Cornell University asking if I would be interested in joining the faculty of a new School of Industrial and Labor Relations. And Ives, uh, Bradley, uh, and I met for a couple of hours. And uh, at the end of our meeting, um, Ives said to me, as far as I'm concerned, I would very much like you to be a member of the faculty. At the outset, there were a lot of 
professors on this campus who didn't want the uh, uh, school here. Uh, they were very critical. Um, and it wasn't just professors in the Arts College. Uh, ag school professors thought it was uh, unfortunate to have a labor relations school here. Uh, the economics people, I think, were not too friendly uh, towards us. Uh, and I suspect the sociologists were, were not enthusiastic about uh, our coming here. I think they, there was a feeling that uh, sooner or later we would be uh, teaching things that belonged uh, in their jurisdiction. The, the departmental lines were very strongly marked here. Well, they were protecting their turf and they saw us as intruders. Uh, we did our best to repair that uh, breach. We did not succeed. And As a matter of fact, um, Dr. Day did a, a remarkable job of uh, convincing uh, members of the faculty of Cornell University uh, that the uh, School of Industrial and Labor Relations should be located here. And well, the first day, uh, Morris was in a hurry because he was house hunting, and we were asked uh, by Phillips Bradley, who was the uh, secretary of the school, uh, if we would uh, do the catalog and the curriculum. And so in one hour, Morris and I uh, managed to develop eight fields of study. The first course I taught was an introduction to industrial and labor relations in which the entire class part, uh, was part. And um, I really devised the course which was a background to industrial relations on the basis of American intellectual history and used Parrington um, as the basic textbook. And that class was handled, uh, was um, uh, housed in um, the auditorium of um, Warren. On the second semester started, Morris and I did all the teaching. Um, we taught the undergraduates and the graduates, and uh, I think we each taught six courses uh, uh, at that time, in every field, I might say, uh, except psychology. Uh, we had one faculty member added in March, uh, Morton, who taught statistics, so the three of us were the faculty. And then we got three more the next fall, which helped a little bit. I uh, taught a course in, in uh, human relations and industry, and also a course in protective labor, legislation, protective labor legislation and social security. These were upper level courses because at the outset in 1946, in September, the only students we had were advanced students. The uh, freshman class that came in there was largely assigned to uh, liberal arts courses taught in the uh, rest of the university. My first teaching assignment here uh, uh, was taking one of the two sections in labor economics. Gene McKelvey took the other one, and then together with Gene, she and I uh, conducted a seminar for the 12 graduate students we then had in the school. You might be interested to know what it was that uh, uh, Ives and uh, Dr. Day wanted me to teach. Uh, they wanted, they thought of me as first of all having charge of labor law since I was a lawyer. So one of the things that uh, they wanted me to to do was to teach labor law, and I, that was quite agreeable to me. Then uh, there was also the uh, the understanding that uh, our students ought to be exposed to a general knowledge of the legal method, uh, the legal process. And one of the things that I taught at the very beginning was a course in law, a general course in law. Um, I have to go back to a, a faculty meeting in May of 1946. In this faculty meeting, the question came up about teaching load and research time and so on. And I, fresh from Colorado, uh, where we had heavy teaching loads and no research time, 
was very much uh, concerned about the issue, and I proposed that uh, we have a two-course faculty load with the understanding that a third of our time would be spent on research. And I recall very distinctly that I slapped the table and said, that will be it. So I take a little credit for getting, for establishing research time and uh, two-course teaching load. So our first students were, um, were veterans. They were a very, very different kind of student from the kind of student we have today. The students that I had in the late 1940s, beginning with 1946, and in the 1950s, uh, were, I think, more mature. They, were, they came here under the GI Bill of Rights, many of them. They were mature students, many of them were married. They had already been in the war. Uh, they were very serious. And I've never seen a group of students but it's so intense on getting an education and getting it fast and getting an education that had some practical significance. Well, I was a civil engineering student and uh, probably was one of the first to hear about the new school because I was at Cornell in civil engineering. So I went to Don Shank, who was the, the admissions director, one of the three people at Warren Hall that made up the INLR school on the top floor. And I made several trips over there to discuss my interests and my determination to transfer. And uh, I was admitted and uh, happily transferred from engineering. They were older for the most part, obviously. And because they were older, um, you never had to worry about they're doing their work. They did what they they did their assignments, uh, and they were very very serious about um, their um, their responsibilities. And I can recall that when we were not perhaps taking care of our business as well as we should, we would uh, take books and split them into sections and uh, work as a team, and then put the notes together in order to get through the. Volume. I had such a good time with my classmates, and they're all about 23, and so I thought I was one of them. Yeah, I think that's what I feel best of all. Um, and they accepted me, and I accepted them. I think they wondered. I didn't wonder, because I knew why I was there, but I think they wondered why I was there. We could only have 15 women in a class in the old days, because uh, the number of women that any school could take here on this campus was determined by the number of beds available to women in the dormitories. And our allotment was 15, which meant that all our women were bright, bright as dollars. Uh, we were founded as an undergraduate school of industrial and labor relations. But very quickly we found out that uh, there was a demand for specialized tr training at the graduate level. And I already had my bachelor's and master's degrees from Columbia University, so I thought Cornell would be a good place for me to investigate at least. And when I came down the hill uh, and overlooked the campus, 96, Route 96, I said, my goodness, it's beautiful. Well, the faculty, in addition to teaching uh, on a very heavy load basis that first semester, the second semester of the school, were also responsible for extension. It was part of the charter of the school that everybody would be what we used to call triple threat, involved in teaching, extension activities, and research. Lynn Emerson who was uh, one of the original members of our faculty, was uh, director of Extension at that time, and I found him a very delightful and uh, understanding individual. He uh, had, uh, had a long career in the field of uh, vocational and industrial education before he came to Cornell. I knew a little about Extension from the then Home Economics Group. I had been out with them on various occasions. 
And um, I knew that you could um, take extension work to people as well as having them come to you. So I was interested and said I would tackle New York City. Well, that was a big tackle. But I was very fortunate in uh, working with the electrical workers. I can well remember the early days of setting up courses with Effie Riley, with Lois Gray in Buffalo, where she uh, had this tremendous support of the steel workers in that area. I was a, a field examiner for the National Labor Relations Board in Buffalo, and I had read about the ILR school and was very much interested in uh, the fact that such a school was established in New York State. And um, when I heard that uh, representatives of the school were coming to Buffalo to uh, set up planning meetings, uh, and the regional director of the board, who knew I was interested in school, invited me to sit in on the meeting. And uh, so after the meeting, I talked with Jean McKelvey and Morris Newfeld about my interest in the school and expressed um, a desire to go on for a graduate degree at ILR. And first thing I knew, instead of hearing about the graduate program, I received a job offer <laughs> to come to work for ILR uh, and to work in the extension division in Buffalo. We tried to set up classes in um, Buffalo, and there was a man at, in our school by the name of Lynn Emerson. And Lynn and I used to go up to Buffalo and that's where we got Lois Gray, right out of the War Labor Board. And uh, Morris went up with us, and um, we got her for the school, you see. Of course, I participated in uh, extension classes from time to time, and even conducted a series of classes for the steel workers in uh, Syracuse. But mostly, I guess, my work with extension took place in the uh, summer programs. And in the early days, uh, Eleanor Emerson was in charge of them. Uh, we borrowed secretaries, we borrowed mimeograph machines, uh, we persuaded um, educational institutions and libraries to give us classroom space, uh, we persuaded people to teach for us with uh, little or no pay. <laughs> so we were able to piece together uh, a, a very uh, interesting program on, you know, virtually nothing, just really on a shoestring. <laughs> it's, an, it's an enriching experience, no question about it. For me, yeah. Um, I think in, there, are, there, are, there are classes I've had in which I could say completely honestly, I learned much more than the members of the class did. Uh, Catherwood really uh, saw extension in the um, ag model, that is in the uh, co-op extension model. Uh, he saw extension as the word implies, extending the campus out to the various cities in New York State. Very soon after I got settled in, it became apparent that the ILR school ought to establish a learned journal in the field of industrial labor relations. And so with the uh, permission of, well, Irving Oz was then dean, uh, I got started on editing of the ILR review, the, the quarterly. And when the school was starting, uh, I got a brief note from President Day telling me about this and asking if I would have any interest in coming here. At the time, I was uh, with the Committee on Human Relations and Industry at the University of Chicago in the heartland of industrial America, and I'm afraid I replied not uh, too cordially or encouragingly to say, uh, in effect, how could I think of leaving Chicago for rural New York State? I had done some lecturing at the school as a guest lecturer. Pete Jensen had me come up for some several times, Phil Fultman. And so when I left the Pope Workers Union, uh, the suggestion, when the suggestion was made that I might come up here, I, uh, boy, I grabbed it before they even asked me. <laughs> I say that I have had five careers, and that the, the fifth was the, was the ILR school. 
And it was something I'd never at all anticipated that I would do, that is, that I would have an academic career. Never in the furthest stretch of my imagination. I hadn't even, um, you know, wished for it or anything of that kind. Um, so that in a, in a sense, it was a whole new world, and I came in as a total innocent into it. The most interesting visitor to the campus was described uh, by Dean Malott, President Dean Malott, as the woman who came to dinner and stayed, and that's Frances Perkins. And uh, Miss Perkins gave lectures uh, throughout the campus. She was available to do it in economics, in history, and so on, and uh, gave these uh, lectures in classes, and or, or sometimes campus-wide lectures. Um, and uh, talked on a wide variety of subjects. I came down here for an interview in, uh, in June of 1946 and uh, met with uh, Phillips Bradley and met Irving Ives and uh, Morris and, uh, and uh, Lynn Emerson was, was another and uh, Shank, uh, Don Shank, who was the director of resident instruction, I believe. And, uh, the the budget in those days was was very ample. I mean, uh, this was uh, an experience that I haven't had any, any since. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, whatever positions I needed, they had apparently a, a lump sum sort of budget, and they just add another line, and uh, that would be it. And uh, we had, a, I recall, forty thousand dollars for books. Uh, this was. Uh, for a specialized library and in those days, I mean, that was uh, amazing. Uh, our target date was, uh, I think it was uh, around the 1st of October was when they scheduled the, the opening. Well, I'm, so, I'm sure that everybody who was associated with the school and at the first uh, of the school's existence would remember the Quonset huts in which the school was housed over on the, what is currently the engineering campus. And we used to say we were really in each other's laps because we were, we were in there desk to desk and uh, at least two people in a small room. And uh, there wasn't much privacy and there wasn't much uh, grace or elegance, no elegance whatever about the situation. We used to have trash cans that would line the halls when it rained to catch the drip and so on. But uh, despite that, or maybe because of that, the morale among the faculty and the students in those early days when we were in the Quonset huts was extremely high. And uh, I have never known a more cordial type of relationship among faculty and students than I th existed in the, those Quonset huts. Martin Catherwood, I think, was just the right man to become dean of the school in the right time. He was an extremely well-organized individual with a forceful personality so that he was able to bring the school together and weld the diverse units into something of, a, of an effective institution. Catherwood was an organizational man. Uh, he had a few conflicts with the faculty. Uh, he wanted the faculty to punch time clocks. Uh, and I remember we, and to be in their offices on Saturday morning. Uh, and we said, what do we do if we need to go to the library? And he said, if there's no secretary there, you can't go to the library. <laughs> so it was a kind of business administration. Uh, and maybe we needed it. We were a little anarchic, uh, probably the first year with everybody doing everything. When I came, uh, uh, there was a requirement that every student uh, take a course that was then known as bus riding. We, we got the students through in buses out to mines and factories to give them some kind of first-hand sense of uh, uh, what uh, work life was like. Ithaca was so isolated that after we'd exhausted the three factories in Ithaca, we had to find other places, and that's how the bus riding trip started. Uh, so the students would uh, be able to leave the Ithaca campus uh, and see something of the real world. Well, the the uh, thing that has uh, had impressed me most from the very beginning was the association with a small group of devoted faculty members 
people who felt that they had a mission in the education and consequently uh, were much more serious about their academic work and their relationships with students than any group of faculty I had previously been associated with. I really look back uh, upon my days at the at Cornell University and at, in particular at the labor school, even with our Quonset huts and the uh, holes in the floor occasionally and all of the um, somewhat of the feeling of the other students on the campus about what have we got here, you know, are we, have we got a bunch of pinkos? <laughs> uh, we all had a great time and uh, we enjoyed it and uh, it was a very special time for me and it was a very special time I think being the end of the World War II and the, and, and, uh, the beginning of a new era. Irv Ives, uh, in describing the mission of the school from the very earliest days, um, said that what he anticipated was that the graduates of the school would meet each other. Uh, there would be a representative of labor, uh, either in an arbitration hearing or labor dispute was a more general term then. And labor would be represented by an ILR alum and management would be and the neutral uh, or public official would be an ILR alum and he used the term the old school tie as you probably know and that this would ameliorate conflict. It was naive notion but actually it's come true. But more importantly, important than that, the school was accepted around the state and uh, there were communities in the state where uh, the view was held that it was just a bunch of radicals who were on the faculty here and uh, it took a little while to overcome some of these prejudices, but they were overcome. And uh, I think the school has fulfilled its mission. I think we've remained as the leading school in, in, among all the uh, schools in the country, and many, many of them have developed some of them under leadership from people we've trained, uh, so that the field has become, I think, a very well-recognized uh, field of industrial and labor relations. I think uh, what is often forgotten and should be stressed is that the New York State School of Industrial and Labor Relations is the only school in the entire country and I think in the world for that matter that offers not only an undergraduate degree which no other school does but offers also the masters and PhD degrees and has the largest uh, extension operation in the entire country. That's the challenge, to be on top, uh, to be out in front, and uh, to, um, you know, constantly to be offering the, these challenges to the practitioner community. Uh, we want uh, ILR to be number one. <laughs>